Hi, uh, this video is going to be about the combinatorial Nullstellensatz, which is a uh, theorem about polynomials that turns out to be really important in combinatorics, um, hence the name combinatorial Nullstellensatz. Uh, and it's one of the main theorems in this uh, sort of newfangled uh, thing called the polynomial method, which reduces combinatorial problems to problems about polynomials and then you still need to solve those problems and the combinatorial nullstellen that's is one of these powerful theorems that lets you do so. So let's state it. So um, theorem. Oh by the way this video is gonna state and prove this theorem, the combinatorial nullstellen that's and also give three applications of it. Um, sort of famous ones. Okay so this is combinatorial no Stellensatz. Okay, so let K be a field. Um, let um, F be a polynomial. So it's in XN. Right there, it's an N uh, multivariable polynomial over the field K. And uh, polynomial such that okay we need a certain uh, term to be to have to be to have non-zero coefficients so this term so x1 d1 uh, xn dn has non-zero coefficient okay and and each term As degree um, less than or equal to the sum of the di's, so d1 plus d1. Okay, so the degree is not too high, and this special term in there has a non zero coefficient. That's all we want out of this polynomial. Okay, so let s1 all the way through sn be subsets of k such that, and these are going to be big, so sj is greater than. It's strictly greater than dj for each j. Um, and now we're going to sample uniformly from each. So we're going to sample um, x1 uniformly from s1 and so on, xn uniformly from sn. So you just pick one uniformly at random from each of these sets. OK. Um, then, okay, but the probability, the null sum that says that the probability that evaluating f at these points, um, the probability that it's zero goes down the bigger these sets, which kind of makes sense. So f x1 xn is uh, not equal to zero. It's greater than something which depends on the size of the size. So it's a uh, S1 times D1 product S n minus D n, and then we have to minus n and we have one uh, over. Well, this is just because we picked um, there's all the different possibilities of x1 through xn that we picked. Okay, so here the um, like I guess, like what is this really saying? I think it's best if we like draw a picture uh, of what's going on. So say k, say k is equal to r, um, the real line r, and we'll say n is equal to two. Well, what's actually going on here? So say we have this um, a polynomial f of x y, and it's a polynomial of two variables. So it can look some some interesting, right? Maybe like this. It's a bad picture. Let's say it's so f of x, y equals zero. That's uh, this set. It's really bad braces. Um, if we pick, I mean, if we pick, say, I'm not going to pick uh, two points here, and let's say um, one point here. So this is s. Um, this is s one. So say this is uh, 
on this axis, it's S1 and it's S2. Um, I'm doing really bad at drawing, of drawing this, but the point is that um, if, if we pick two points on, uh, on this axis and say one point on that axis, then okay, let's completely do that. Um, say we pick two points in S1, okay, this one and this one, S1. And then we pick this point in S2, okay? And I kind of drew it off kilter, but like maybe this is the size of S1 cross S2, right? It's only two points, two times one. And maybe F is actually zero on those points. But if we add another, as, as the sizes of the SJ get bigger, so say there are, we take more points here and we pick another point here, and now we take the product. So there should be what, uh, eight points now. So the product looks like this. Uh, then there's lots of points where F is not zero. Okay, so it's saying that um, you have a fixed polynomial F and you're gonna make these sets bigger and bigger. Um, so the probability of picking a zero at random is gonna go down. Okay. So to prove this, um, we're not gonna prove this right away. We're gonna prove a lemma first. So, um, you know, oh, I, I should also say that most applications don't really use this bound. They just use that it's non-zero. So in common torics, I mean, you usually just need the existence of something um, a lot. Of, all the applications we're gonna do today only use the fact that this probability is non-zero. They don't actually use the quantitative bound that we have here. Um, okay, so we're gonna first prove a lemma. Okay, so um, once again, let K be a field. Um, okay, you fix F um, in K is one through Xn. Uh, F is not identically zero, so it's a non-zero polynomial. Um, suppose the degree of f in the variable xj um, is uh, less than equal to dj uh, for all j. Okay, so the once again, it's it's like a. Uh, I'm getting a little mixed up with the. Uh, I need to make sure that I get the hypotheses right because they're similar but not exactly the same. So it's less than equal to dj for all j. And once again, let S1 through Sn be subsets of K with, and now here we let Sj um, be greater than equal to Dj. So yeah, slight difference. Um, so once again, but the, the statement is similar. So sample X1 uniformly from S1. Uh, Xn uniformly from Sn uh, and everything between. And then the probability that f of x1, xn is not equal to zero is greater than equal to this product of j equals one to n, sj minus dj over the product of all the si's. So s1. Okay. Um, and this is, I, I should point out, this is related to a lemma called the Schwartz uh, Zippel lemma. And it's, it's not really the same. So Schwartz Zippel says that, so note, uh, this is Schwartz Zippel. Um, it has slightly different hypotheses. So in the Schwartz Zippel lemma, <laughs> We have it in my notes somewhere. Um, yeah, so it's it's we have the total degree. So F has total degree degree um, D. So it's it's something like up here the total degree would be less than equal to um, the sum of the di's. So it's slightly different. We have total degree D, and we just have one set as subset K, uh, and it says that. It's the same thing, but we have the probability of x1 through xn uh, be zero, non-zero. 
is greater than or equal to one minus d over s. So, um, yeah, the, the it, it's like really similar flavor, and, and the proof is actually very similar. But we have to be a bit more um, short. Suppose like it's weird. It has slightly different hypotheses, but it's sort of stronger in some sense. Um, because we're more careful in that proof. But anyway, let's prove this one. So proof of lemma. I'm not sure it's the actual lemma. Okay, so uh, how do we prove it? So it's by induction on n. Uh, so when n equals one, what do we have? So when n equals one, um, well, a polynomial in one variable of degree one, of degree not one, d1, has at most uh, d1 roots. And I think the, we, need, we need k to be a u of d for this to hold, but k is a field, so we're fine. Um, and wow, well, so, so the probability of picking a non-root Well, in the worst case, S contains all the roots of this polynomial, uh, S1. Um, so the probability of picking a non-root is at least uh, S1 minus D1, right? And so oh, hang on. over the number of um, elements that are actually in S. Um, so we're done. So that, that's sort of just an application when n equals one, it's just like high school um, factor theorem. Um, a polynomial degree d has at most d roots. Okay, so now, um, so now let n be greater than one. Uh, assume true for minus one. Okay, so standard induction. Um, so first, we sample. So I well, first, okay, let, let, let's do this way. Um, I have slightly different in my notes, but we note that if we let gx be, hang on, I'll just follow my notes. Um, sample, we're gonna sample the first n minus one. Okay, so we're just, we've sampled them already and we let gx, um, which is a one variable polynomial um, be, this. So we've already fixed the first n minus one guys, and then we just put x in the nth slot. Okay, this is, this is a polynomial of, um, of just one variable. Okay, and there exists, so there, there exists f1, uh, f0, f1, all the way up to f uh, dn, such that so we're just grouping the like terms and, and we get g of x is equal to, um, well, it's f of x1 or f0 of x1 through x n minus one. So that's the parts that don't have an x in it. Plus now with one x, x1 and um, so on, all the way up to x to the dn, uh, f1. Uh, d n x one to x n minus one, and this uses the hypothesis that in the variable uh, in the last variable we don't have degree more than d n. Um, okay, and and one of these, at least one of these f i, um, have to have to not be be identically zero. Right. If they were all identically zero, then you would just have g of x be the zero polynomial, which would mean that f was the zero polynomial, which um, we assume that is not the case. Okay, so what do we do next? So one of these fi's is uh, not zero, so it actually satisfies our induction hypothesis. So we get, um, so we have by the induction hypothesis, um, we have probability that fi of x1 through xn, which remember are actually random, like we've sampled them already, so they're fixed, but they were random to begin with. 
and the probability that it's not that this polynomial is not zero um, is greater than you no. Know, we have a product of j equals one to n minus one of s j minus e j over uh, all of this over s one. Um, as n minus one. Okay, um, and so given that this is true, uh, now we have that g of x is not is a non-zero polynomial. Right, one of these is non-zero, so g of x is now a non-zero polynomial. So given that this is true, um, we can use sort of what we did before with like the factor theorem. Um, let's just write it out in full. So probability that the entire the original f is non-zero. Uh, well, this is greater than equal to uh, the probability that g uh, x n is non -equal, non equal to zero and f uh, x one to x n is oh, the last one, sorry, f i. So one of, this is this f i uh, is non equal to zero. Okay, and then we just expand out the conditional probability. Uh, right, I mean, I mean, let's just see why this is the case. If g of xn is not zero, uh, and if i, that this guy is not zero, that means that one of these terms was non-zero to begin with, and then the whole thing is not zero, so f is not zero. Um, and, well, and <laughs> I'm probably getting too into the weeds here, but it's greater than equal to because it's possible for f to not be zero and f i is actually zero. Right, because we just said at least one of the FIs is not zero. Um, okay. So now we expand out this uh, conditional probability. And so it's G X of N is not equal to zero given that FI X1 to X N minus one um, is not equal to zero. Oops. And then we already know the probability that F1 uh, through X N fi of x1 through x n minus 1 is not 0. That's what we did here. We mentioned the boxes. So um, let's write it So let just write it again. Sj minus dj plus 1 plus n minus 1. OK. And um, by sort of a similar thing to the four, um, the polynomial with uh, at most dn roots has to, um, with, yeah, at most dn roots has to have, what, what am I trying to say? A degree at most dn has at most um, dn roots. So then we, this first guy just turns out to be s n minus dn over s n. And once we multiply by this product, which is already there, uh, I don't really want to write it all out. G, dj s1 s minus one, uh, which is exactly what we want to prove uh, right here. Right? Uh, this goes to n minus one. So if you multiply that, you get it over all of n. Okay. So like I said, um, this is similar to the short simple lemma, and the short simple lemma is like. I mean, once again, the hypotheses are slightly different, but um, it's slightly stronger in that when you do this conditional argument, we don't just take a greater than here. We actually consider the other case. Mm -hmm. like it, there's more to it. It's on Wikipedia. You can make it up. Okay. Um, so we want to prove, let's prove the most of the now. So um, the thing is, I can take this and have a little fun here. Take this guy and copy it. Uh, copy. So this works. It's lost. Um, okay. Put it here. And we're going to prove it now that we have this left. So prove. Okay. So, sort of the main issue is that if you look at these two statements, we kind of like to just use this lemma right away. But the problem is, in this lemma, the degree of f in the variable xj is less than the dj. Now, we don't have the same thing here. We, we, we just have every term has degree less than or equal to this sum. 
So we can't just use it um, right away. So I okay, think let's write down main issue. Uh, F has degree less than equal to D1 plus Dn in variable xj, not uj. So we can't just use it right away. Okay. But note that we can sort of, um, we can like change, uh, alter f a bit um, by subtracting these polynomials. So, so note fj, uh, we're going to call, for every j, we're going to define this polynomial called fj of x, which is the product of all s and sj, x minus uh, x, yeah, x minus s. Okay. So why are we doing this? Well, note that this this um, this product here is zero for every s that's in. Um, it's zero on all s that are actually in S J. Right? If you plug in any s that's in S J, uh, you're gonna put get s minus s in one of the uh, in one of the factors, and the whole thing is gonna be zero. Okay. So um, setting so changing. So altering f by replacing, so we're gonna replace xj to the s j uh, with uh, xj to the sj, but minus fj of xj, okay? So every time we see this, we're gonna add that. Uh, we're gonna change it, replace it with this instead. Then we still have something that's, uh, I mean, notice this guy has degree the size of SJ because there are, that's how many, that's how many um, factors there are in that polynomial. So once we replace it, okay, F is still gonna be the same on SJ for all points in SJ. It could be a different, I mean, it's gonna be a different polynomial, but it's gonna be the same on the set SJ. Uh, and now its degree is at most SJ uh, minus one. So uh, its degree in the variable sj is um, at most sj minus one. So it's its degree in variable uh, xj is less than equal to sj minus one. Uh, okay. So we can do this for all the j. So do this for all j, uh, one less than equal to j, less than equal to n. Okay, so now we can apply the lemma. I mean, we still don't have quite, we still don't have dj, but we can apply the lemma. And what do we get? We get the probability that f x1 through xn is not equal to zero, is greater than, um, it's sj minus, not dj, but sj um, plus one over, and this is a product, right? So product over j equals one to n, uh, s1, s n. And what is this? This is just one over s1, s n. Okay, so note that if we just want to use, we just want to prove that this is non-zero, then we're already done. And in fact, that's all we really need for all the applications we're going to do. But um, you know, just for fun, we, let's let's actually refine it to make it um, equal to this thing on the right. Um, just bound, like give a lower bound on the probability. Okay, this would be true if we have so if um, S J equals D J plus one for all um, for all J, then we're done. We're actually done. Okay, right? Because then, then you just if you plug it up there, you get all these things, and then they uh, cancel out, and then you get one. So on the top, so we'd actually be done. But in general, so for for general sizes of SJ, all we know is that taking subsets. Sj prime of Sj uh, with uh, the size of Sj prime 
uh, equal to dj uh, plus one. Is dj plus one? Yeah, for all j. There is a non root of. Um, so we're using kind of bootstrapping from what we've proven, which is that if this is true, then we're done. Uh, there's a non root of f in s1 prime all the way up to s n prime. Okay, so we can bootstrap this to kind of make the probability go up. Uh, and how are we going to do that? Well, we start with, so start. Um, so we make the wheel create a set A of non roots as follows. Okay, so we, we start with, um, so pick an, any S1, S1 prime up to Sn prime and all of the Sj prime uh, have size exactly equal to dj plus one. Okay, so we start with like that. And there must be a non-root in there. So add the there is uh, a1 through a n in this set uh, such that let's call this a f of a is um, non-zero. Okay, so we add, so add a to the set a. Now we we're gonna amend, we're gonna change this set here. Um, so replace a1 in s1 prime with another element in s1 set minus s1 prime. It's, it's going to be a new one. Uh, a new element. So if we're going to keep repeating this, it's got to be an element we haven't seen before. OK, so this can be done. How many times can we do this? Well, it's going to be sj minus dj plus 1 uh, in general for j. I mean, for 1, it's s1 minus d1 uh, plus 1. OK. so. Um, after we run out of, after we run out of new elements, um, the size of A will be equal to uh, S J. Um, so it would be, be this: it would be S one minus D one plus one plus uh, and then we go on to um, S1. Is it a plus one or a minus one? Let me check my notes. Minus one. So here, minus one. Um, Sn minus Dn. And we minus all, all the minus ones become minus n. Um, so this is almost what we want. We just need this, but we need a plus one here, a uh, plus one there. So um, that comes from the very last choice. So the plus one comes from the last S1 prime to send time, which is after we run out of new elements, we still have one left, and we can pick another non-root. And so that gives us the plus one. Okay, so if we uniformly choose, then we're going to get this probability. Okay, but really, I mean, that, that's kind of an extra detail that we add for fun. But um, really, we just need that it's non-zero, and the point, the proof that it's non-zero is right here. It's super short; it's like five lines, um, and that's all we're going to use when we get to applications, which is what we're going to do. So um, our first application, so example one. Um, it's subgraphs of multigraphs. So, so I, I mean, I guess I guess I should say for history's sake. So, I mean, the comment from Ernest Stalinzatz was um, is from a paper from 1999 um, by Noga Alon, 
And I think some of the ideas were already existing, but he really put it all together into a 1999 paper. Um, and yeah, so this result um, that we're going to prove with the null shell and dots was actually proved by Alan, I think Friedland and Kalai uh, in like uh, the 80s. So it's an older result, but it can be proved with um, null shell and dots pretty easily. So here's the proposition. Um, so let P be prime. Um, any multigraph with uh, more than P minus one times N edges, okay, it contains a non empty subgraph uh, such that every vertex has has degree um, divisible of, uh, multiple of p. Okay, so what is this trying to say? Um, let's uh, so we have so we have multigraph uh, on three vertices, and we want more than p minus one n edges. So say p is two. Um, so we need more than six edges. Okay, so let's draw more than six edges. Um, what is that? That's seven edges, right? Sorry, it's a little messy. Um, the point is we can pick a subset of these guys. Um, we're going to get a subgraph of this graph. So it's a subset of the edges such that every vertex has exactly, um, has a multiple P edges coming out of it. So notice here, this guy here has, um, right now it has one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, that's multiple two, that's okay, that's already fine. Uh, actually, it, in this case, the subgraph turns out to be the whole graph, I think, because this is already even, oops, this is already even, and this is already even. Yeah, they're already even, so uh, the statement's kind of trivial here, but okay, you get the point. Okay, so how are we gonna prove this? So proof. Okay, so, so uh, let G be a multigraph. Be a multigraph uh, satisfying the hypothesis that is more than P minus one edges. Okay, we're gonna construct a polynomial um, over the field of P elements in the following way. So construct F um, over you know, so K B being uh, to be FP. Okay, uh, and how, uh, or okay, uh, hang on. We need to know what how many variables there are and there's actually gonna be a lot of variables. Um, so with a variable X E for all E in the edge set of G. So there's gonna be one variable for every edge in this multigraph. Okay, so for each, so how are we gonna build this app? Well, for each vertex in the vertex set of G, um, we define f of v of x. Um, x is a vector um, with e. Okay, I'll, I'll write it later. Um, it's gonna be this product. So it's gonna be um, the, all the edges such that v is uh, in the edge. Um, that, that just means all the edges that v is um, sort of adjacent to. Um, we're going to take a product of this. So one minus, um, oops, no, 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 hang on. I'm getting ahead of myself. That's later. So we're just going to sum over x e. Okay, so uh, of all v in e. So for, for example, I mean, the um, f v of this vertex here is going to have six terms because there are six edges coming out. So this loop counts twice. So you need six terms in that polynomial. And note that the degree, so um, you should note that x is, uh, is really a vector indexed by the edges. Okay, well, what, what's, um, 
Yeah, so note that that V has degree one and less than equal to one in every variable. Okay, uh, anyway, so we let F of X, this is what I was gonna do. We take a product over all V in vertex set of one minus F V of X to the P minus one. Okay, then we subtract all the edges uh, and for every edge, we subtract one minus X. Okay. Um, so, all right. So we're going to want to use the no slow dots. We need to check some stuff before we can use it. Um, the, the degree. So what's the degree of F? So degree of F, uh, well, it equals, it's the maximum of the degree of this term uh, and the degree of that term. So it's the maximum. What's the degree on this side? Well, it's, I don't know, I can't draw. Okay. Uh, well, we have, this is degree one, and it's the power of p minus one. And then we take overall vertices and their n vertices. So it's p minus one and on this side. This side, the degree is the number of edges. Okay. Um, but we know the number of edges um, is greater than p minus one by hypothesis. So this is the, the degree of f is um, is the number of edges. Okay, and well, um, this coefficient we need to check that this specific term has coefficient non-zero. And what is that term? Well, it's the product uh, of x e overall e and e g uh, has non-zero coefficient, which is well, what is it? Well, it could be one or it could be minus one, depending on whether we have an even or odd number of edges. It's minus one uh, to the power of the number of edges. And it doesn't matter. The point is it's not zero. Okay, so now we can apply null sum that. Now, what does the null sum that tell us? Um, it tells us that there's, if, if we take a, it tells us that there exists some subgraph. So there are, so by null sum that, There exists an, a, a subset of the edges such that, okay, if we set x e equal to one for all e in this edge set, and well, x e equals zero otherwise, um, then uh, we have f of x, which is the vector of these xe's, uh, is not equal to zero. Okay, so that's what more strong that gives us. But wh what does it mean for this vector to not be zero? Well, uh, we, first of all, let, let g prime be the subgraph of g with, I uh, guess, v g prime is the same, which is v of g, but E, the edge set of G prime is B prime. Okay, what does it say about this subgraph? Well, um, I mean, note that like we can't, hang on. The, um, so now X is the solution. F of V of X is, remember, the degree of V um, in the subgraph. Okay, and or, okay, it's the degree of mod p because, you know, uh, it only has values in zp anyway. Um, but okay, so it's the degree and we can't pick none of the edges because if, if we pick none of the edges, then this guy here, um, if we pick none of the edges, we would have one here, minus one equals zero. So then f of x would be zero, but that's not true. So we can't pick none of the edges. So we pick at least one edge. And if we pick at least one edge, then this guy becomes zero, right? So for the entire thing to be non-zero, then this, this term has to be 
non-zero. Okay, so what does it mean for so one minus f v x of p minus one is non-zero? Is non-zero. Okay, that's what we we've, we've figured out. Um, this is all v v g, of course. Well, for this to be non-zero, this means that uh, every single every single uh, one of these guys has to be one. Or not not one, sorry. It's not one. Or else it would be zero. And but notice that a to the p minus one is uh, equal to one for all um, a not equal to zero in p. Right? So the fact that this is non-zero. Um, this is for Maslow theorem, by the way. And the fact that this is non-zero uh, implies that the degree of v in the multigraph uh, has to be a multiple of p. Okay, so we have a subgraph where the degree of every vertex is a multiple of p, and that came from the Moisson graph. So it's kind of a it's kind of a cool theorem. Uh, uh, I don't know. If you have enough edges, then you have to have sort of there's a way you can uh, fix this so that it makes a deregular subgraph um, or like P regular, P regular subgraph, I guess. I guess that means it, uh, I can't think of it on the spot, but like, if you make the bound correct, you're good at uh, P regular subgraph. Okay. Okay, so uh, that's one application. And now we're gonna do something uh, entirely different and we're gonna prove the um, uh, theorem about some sets. So what are some sets? Um, so, yeah. so, so if we have subsets A, B, um, subset of some field, so F, P, um, then we define A plus B is the subset um, consisting of all A plus B, where A is an A and B is an B, okay? And you don't actually need a POV. I mean, these are defined for groups, but we're going to prove a theorem about them uh, in the case where it's a cyclic group, so a field. Okay, so this is theorem. It's called the Cauchy Davenport theorem. And this is, it's, it's an interesting name because Cauchy died in like uh, 1857, and Davenport wasn't born until 1907. So that's so they clearly didn't work together on this. Uh, but anyway, they both sort of proved it um, separately. I'm not really sure of the story. I'm, I'm not sure if they forgot about it and then Davenport proved it or if Koshi proved this weaker version and Davenport proved the stronger version. I'm not really sure of the story. Okay, but it says let k equals equal fp um, be a finite field of time order. Prime order P. Uh, let A and B be subsets of K. Then, okay, the Cauchy Davenport theorem says that some uh, some sets A plus B can't be too small. So A plus B is greater than minimum of P or A plus B minus one. And and so there's really two cases here. Okay. And P is the size of the whole field. So, okay, so proof. Um, there's kind of the easy case where, so if um, the size of A plus the size of B is greater than P, right? That means that A and B intersect. Because if you have a subset A and subset B of, um, of, of a group that only has P elements, then they have to intersect, right? But we can say even more than that. Um, for any S in K, the set um, S minus B, so this is exactly what it sounds like, it's S minus B for all B and B, it has the same size as B, has uh, the same size as B. So in particular, so it must intersect A. Uh, a, right? So there has to be some element that's in both of them. Okay. So for so for some a, a, b, 
can be, uh, what does it, it intersecting mean? It means that A is equal to S minus B, uh, i.e. S is equal to A plus B. So S is in the set A plus B. So we've just shown that any element of the field is already in A plus B, right? So in this case, A plus B has the size of the whole field. Okay, so that's the easy case. Um, the other case is we have if A plus B is less than equal to T. Okay, um, and now if this holds, then what are we trying to do? We're trying to prove that um, now then the minimum would be this side. So we're trying to prove that the size of A plus B is uh, size of A plus size of B uh, minus one, or it's greater than that at least. Okay. Um, how we're going to do that is we're going to take a random or like an arbitrary subset of um, size slightly. Um, let's just say, so let C uh, subset of K have size A plus B minus two. So it, uh, it's hard to do this verbally. We're trying to show that A plus B um, this set A plus B, the sum set, it can't be contained in C. If we can prove that for arbitrary C, um, then we've shown that the sum set must have size strictly greater than this. So we'll have to do more than that. So let F be this polynomial. It's polynomial of two variables, x1, x2. Uh, it's going to be product C and C of x1 minus x2 uh, plus x2 minus C. Okay, so let d1 equal the size of a minus 1, d2 is the size of b minus 1. Okay, and note that the coefficient of, um, of this guy, x1 for d1, x2 d2 is, well, um, by the, you know, this product, um, by the binomial theorem, it's a plus b minus 2, uh, choose a minus 1, or choose b minus 1, and that's just by uh, dis distributing the, uh, the product. Okay, and, and this is, this is not 0. And this is non-zero mod p since a plus b minus two is less than uh, it's strictly less than p. Okay, so it's it's you know it's factorial, right? You're gonna multiply out the factorials, but none of those things are um, none of those things are divisible by p, so we're fine. So that's non-zero. So that's one thing we have to check. Um, uh, the other thing that checks what well, we're going to set, so we're going to take S1 to be A, S2 to be B, and so they, the size of S1 is greater than D1, and the size of S2 is greater than D2. Uh, and by common foil, um, no stones at, there are A and A, B and B, such that f of a b is well this is the product of c and c a plus b minus c is non-zero so what does it mean for it to be non-zero um that means that there wasn't any c in c that equaled a plus b or hang on no there has to be some a some sort of sum a plus b that isn't in C, right? So what does it say? say? So the sum set A plus B, um, take out all the elements of C, must be non-empty. Because if every element of A plus B, uh, if every element of A plus B was in C, then uh, this would be zero. Okay, so um, well, what does that say? Well, that says that 
Uh, so since C was arbitrary, um, A plus B must have size greater than or equal to A plus B uh, minus one. Or else A plus B, like taking the sum set to be C would have made um, this not work. Okay, so that's the Cauchy Davenport theorem. It's a pretty important theorem in, um, I guess, added in number theory. And it pops out uh, from the common formal shell and that's. So um, this is actually one of the examples that um, Noga Alon put right after he proved the null and that's in his 1999 paper. And um, so it's, it's a very famous application of the null and that's. And we're going to do the other one. So he put two examples right after. And we're just going to do the other one now. It's another famous theorem that comes out pretty easily from the most side maps. So this theorem is uh, um, Chevalier. It's by Chevalier, and it's proved in 1935. Um, some people call it the Chevalier-Varning theorem, which is actually slightly stronger because Varning um, made or he, he improved it. But we're just going to prove the, the original. So um, let K be a finite field. Um, finite field on Q elements. And well, Q is a prime power. OK, so we have a system of polynomials. So let F1 through Fn be polynomials. Uh, on n variables. Okay, if we have some restrictions, if n is greater than the degree of f1 plus all the way up to the degree of fn, uh, and there exists a, which is a1 up to a n in um, the affine space, uh, such that uh, f i of a is equal to zero for all i, then this theorem says that there can't, so if there's a zero, I mean, if there's a point such that all the polynomials in this collection are zero on that point, then there has to be another one. You can't ha just have one zero. Then there is a prime, it's the same thing, one prime in Kn uh, with its difference, so it's not the same, such that fi a prime is also zero for all i. Okay, and the Chevalier Varning theorem is slightly stronger than this. It says that the number of zeros has to be a multiple of the characteristic of the field. And the characteristic of a finite field is a prime, so it has to be at least two. And so that's why you get Chevalier's Chevalier theorem from that. Right? So there's at least two. Um, if, there's a, if there is a zero, there has to be at least two. OK, so let's prove it. And once again, it's going to come down to choosing a clever polynomial. So we're going to, I split it up a little bit. So let g of x1 through xn equal this product. So it's similar to the previous um, proof. Is it the previous proof? Uh, two proofs ago, um, where we used the fact that the group of units of a finite field is uh, cyclic. So we take fi, which is equal to n, fi of x1 through xn to the q minus 1. Okay, and h of x1 through xn is going to be this double product. We take product over j, uh, j, 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 i, i equals 1 to n, uh, and all s not equal to a i, x i minus s. So this guy is zero if it's not a i. Um, this double product is zero if you don't plug in a. And then anything different to a, it would be. Is that is that right? X i minus, uh, or it's non-zero. 
What, what, am, I, what am I trying to say? No, it, it is zero. Okay. Um, I might have said it backwards. Okay. Anyway, we're, we're just going to continue, and I'll see which is the right one. Okay. So we let uh, let f of x one through x n be g of x one through x n minus lambda h of x n through x n, where uh, lambda is chosen to make f of a equal to zero. Okay, note that, um, note that g of a, g of a is equal to one. Right? Um, if you plug in a here, g of a is equal to one. And you plug in a here, you get zero, or not, you get something that's non-zero. So lambda, so lambda is actually, it's just determined already. It's, it's H of a uh, multiplicative inverse, okay? I'm just saying that. And in particular, it's not zero. That's all we actually need. Okay. Um, so what's the degree of F? So I'm gonna play this game again. Degree of F is the maximum of degree of G, degree of H, right? Um, but so what's the degree of just like, let's write it out. So the degree of G is, well, um, it's the degrees of this, um, sorry, this has degree um, of FI. Uh, and we're taking it to the Q minus one. So it's Q minus one times the degree times the sum of the degrees, so f1 plus degree f, degree f m, okay? And on this side, it's just, um, this product is over q minus one elements. It's over the whole field except for one guy. So it's q minus one and n. So it's q minus one times n. But by the hypothesis, um, we have n is greater than this sum. So that's, um, Q minus one. Right. The maximum is Q minus one. Okay, so we have the degree of F. Um, okay, cool. So let let uh, di be equal to Q minus one for all i. Note that the coefficient of this product i equals one to n x i g i. Uh, well, it, it's just on this side, right? So it's equal to is minus lambda, which is not zero. Okay, so we can use the most down that. Um, we set, so by most down that with uh, s i equal to the whole field for all I, and we can do that because di is q minus one, right? So the whole field has cardinality q. Um, there must be a point. Must be a point a prime, which is a one prime, all the way to a n prime in the affine space, um, such that f of a prime is not zero, okay? So this already means, so this means A prime is not equal to A, right? Because F of A is zero. So A prime is not equal to A. That means that for some coordinate, A prime has to have a different, so A, A I prime is different from A I prime in some I, which makes this guy here, um, it makes this guy here zero. So for the whole thing to be non-zero, g of a prime has to be non-zero. Okay, so, so g of a prime is non-zero. Well, how can g of a prime be non-zero? I mean, you have this product. They, I mean, for it to be non-zero, every single one of them, every single one of these has to be one. Uh, has to not be one. I always get this mixed up. 
every single one of these has to not be one. And the only way for that to be true, okay, uh, is for fi of a prime to be zero for all i. Okay, so you can I see what's been happening here? We want this thing to be non-zero for all i, this thing that I circled. So the inside has to be zero for all i. But that's exactly what we wanted, right? We wanted to find uh, an a prime such that f i of a prime is zero for all i. Okay, and once again, this uses the fact that the, uh, uh, the group of units of a finite field is cyclic. So any other, any non-zero field element um, taken to the q minus one is gonna equal one, the multiplicative unit. And so you'd have it zero unless you have, um, this factor would be zero unless the inside is zero. Maybe I said something wrong there. I hope you get the idea anyway. And so that's going to be all for this video. Um, we saw the combinatorial Milstein's out, um, which we proved with some kind of variant of the short civil lemma. And um, we have a probabilistic bound on it, but we don't really need that. We just need the fact that it's non zero. And then we proved three very different theorems that were all proven before the Milstein's out was proven, but I mean, the proofs were a lot more involved before, and the null stones that gives quite easy proofs for all of them. So I hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you next time.